All right. It's the guy, PB Magna 4 here. Um, got a good response on that best deck in MetaZoo history video. And I thought, hey, based on some of that response, why don't I share a little information, a little historical lesson on the deck that maybe, not maybe, the deck that won the most money in the history of MetaZoo. So, strap in for this fantastic historical lesson and let me take you down a ride down memory lane so for a little context the biggest cash prize event in metazoo's history was caster cup um and i forget the total prizing i think it was like half a million something like that and um prior to caster cup i had no particular uh, affiliation with any teams or anything like that. I was sort of a mercenary or whatever. A, somebody that I just like playing and I didn't want to deal with all the team drama. I'll be forward with that. Um, anyhow, Easton Evans and I, the Caster Cup winner, worked together on putting together a deck that we thought would be um, kind of on top of the meta at the time. The This was in the Wilderness meta, so... Prior to that, in the Nightfall meta, it was dominated by water and water mirrors. Uh, going into Wilderness, we had the Radioactive Hornets that really helped control the board and help with the water mirror, but it wasn't really necessarily a guaranteed win. Um, there's times where just Frog would get out and you just couldn't do things. So for those that don't know what I'm talking about, that's okay. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and talk about the deck a little bit and maybe how it interacted during that time. Both him and I ran the same deck. I believe the deck I have here, I'm not sure if it's one for one the same as what we ran at Caster Cup, but we did run the same thing. Easton got first. I got fifth. I always sort of uh, attributed a lot of the success, at least that I had in MetaZoo or whatever. Um, you know, I'm a bit more of a deck builder and somebody like Easton was like a fantastic pilot, right? So, you know, if you're in Formula One, you could have a, you, you want to have great mechanics, but you also need somebody that can drive it. So I, I definitely would say shouts out to him for just being a great card player and all that other good stuff. But for me, you know, fifth place was pretty good. But by and large, this deck just slapped. Um, and there's only one card in here that I think you couldn't play in today's meta so anyways let, let, let's get on with the deck tech um let's see here and i was going to build this in paper because paper's fun but i am lazy so and you can't see all the cards right now because of my head but as a quick highlight um this is a 40 card deck later into the my deck building i moved towards 41 cards with 11 aura i think and two artifacts. This is a um, 10 aura deck with two artifacts and shock aura. So I'll touch on that here in a bit. But um, the ratios are such the there is a splash of dark in here, and you really want to see that dark. I'll touch on that in a second. Um, and you got your rocks and the shock aura. Really, lightning had always been one of the most dominant decks to begin with and I think one of the most slept on cards was Shock Aura being that it was a Prism Aura in an early meta that didn't didn't have one. It wasn't until Wilderness that we got Prism Aura that allowed us to cast multicolors and things like that. So anyways, uh I'll just peel off the first several lightning auras here. All right, lightning aura, lightning aura, lightning aura. The one dark aura. Touch on that later. Prism aura because prism aura was is is and really was and really is good. Um, put that over here. Our rocks. So tap these to uh, generate two lightning aura. Drawing into this early game turn one almost guaranteed that you're going to be able to cast your quets um, turn two. And this deck was called Crooked Quets because at the time, a lot of people were building their decks mono. 
<clears throat> this deck allowed you to kind of counter anything and everything. It was for a time that didn't have a lot of high, uh, you know, for a meta that didn't have a lot of hybrid decks, this is about as close as you'd get to it, even with the one dark splash. So I'll touch on that in a bit too, as well. Shock aura. Once again, um, enters the arena. If you lose 50 LP, which is nothing in meta zoo, then, uh, you know, it comes in awakened. It does cost you one of these, so, but you could bring this in and tap it for any color. So if you had just this online, you'd be able to combo with it or one of your prism auras. So we'll get there as well. Uh, Quetz, you know, I, for those that aren't familiar with the card, this was a day one. I, I knew nothing about MetaZoo. I remember cracking first edition early on, and I was building decks with a buddy of mine, knowing nothing about this this game, and just seeing how incredibly busted this card was. Um, this really kind of set the power scale for the game, really up until Native, that the R&D kind of seemed like they tried to break that paradigm a bit. Um its power cardinal wins was never really relevant, but I always thought that would be a cool thing to have built into. Reveal the top page of your spell book if it's not an aura page and it starts with N W E S deal twenty five damage to target page or caster. Again, not really relevant. The flying fleet for strike and the fifty from the lightning storm uh was enough to make this thing a true threat. So given that it would hit with 80 but you almost ha always had a light bulb as your fourth wall item and it would proc off your opponent's light bulb as well if it was a fourth wall so this thing was hitting for like 90 to 100 at caster cup so um just a huge threat and quad quets is was your win con condition right uh this is basically the cornerstone deck for a lot of meta zoo's history and I still preferred it over the water mirror with the frogs in <laughs> Nightfall. Uh, one Thunderbird. Some people were like, ah, why don't, you know, they'd run two or whatever. For me, one. I thought Thunderbird was always a bit lackluster, but it did have this really neat ability where, um, let's see here. Yeah. Lightning Talons. If this attack destroyed a beastie, you may awaken another beastie not named Thunderbird. So you could. Uh, really, if they had any kind of tokens, which was sometimes the case with some of these decks, this beastie would really shut down uh, their board. Or not even shut down, but just give a lightning in a bottle to a Quetz, which is, which is always a problem. Paralyze might have also been one of the most busted traits in MetaZoo. Paralyze just shut down uh, a page's whole text effect, right? So they would still have their traits, but if they had any kind of arena or any kind of text effect you know here it just turned it off and uh things like gumbaroo that you know had that really kind of nasty recoil effect or whatever on a coin flip you could just choose to delete that text box delete its tribal boost and uh remove that off the field phantom card day one this thing was just like uh, you know that's what i always liked about metazoo is like you know we could say oh you know, balance is good and that I think balance is BS in card games. You don't want balanced card games. There's no such thing as also a truly balanced card game. It, it, but if you really wanted to play like balanced cards and things like that, you would just play like poker or whatever. So all that said, Phantom car was just candidly busted. It was smoky spirits. For those that don't know, smoky spirits ended combat. That's kind of what made the frog deck so oppressive. But in here in particular, you got to, Literally, it came in with Fleet and Spirit, so the Spirit's are just a really tough evasion to begin with. And then not only that, it came in Awakened. And its power, you got to tap it to activate at any time during combat, so, you know, during the opponent's turn. And you could flip a coin, and if heads, you would end that combat. That is just, like, incredibly strong. So, we ran two of those. Um... And again, I don't know if this is one for one, the Caster Cup deck. I, I want to say I ended up running three, but uh, I'd have to go back to my notes. This is literally the deck that was saved in. Uh, I went through, we went through like 11 versions of this deck. This is version 11. This is the last one I could find. So this is the one I'm showing y'all. But 
whenever I ran three of them, I called it the dealership. Oh, yeah, there's three of them. Cool. So, yeah, run three of those. And then Hornets. You know, I touched on that earlier. It's contract for one aura. You got to put three bodies on the board, and this thing had flying and paralyzed. So I had an invasion trait, and then also had the chance to paralyze uh, beasties. Now, we knew that going into Caster Cup, there would be the mirror, right? Um, a lot of people would probably be on lightning. We knew a lot of people would be on water, and then there would be rogue decks. But by and large, you want to be able to beat the mirror, and you want to be able to beat lightning or water. With the hornets, we knew we could beat water, but the the mirror is something that I was never too keen on. With that in mind, the one thunderbird, if we did see it or whatever, it would definitely pick on or eat these <laughs> hornets essentially, and you know, awaken the quets and start beating in. Just as I had said earlier, this even though it's only twenty damage, it's enough to kill hornets and. You know, a lot of times that's enough. So I think we did four of them just because you want to see them, especially turn one, uh, especially against water. You just need to establish that board as soon as possible. Otherwise, that frog's going to town. And uh, really, these tokens and things like that, they they taxed the opponent's, um, you know, Smoky Spirits resources. There's only so much they could do as far as hitting all the hornets on board. And to, to, I guess for those that weren't around back then, it should probably be worth talking about the water deck. Just how purely oppressive it was. I, I would argue is to say some people really liked the Nightfall water meta. I would say that's the lowest point in MetaZoo's, you know, meta history or whatever. But, you know, that's what we got. Uh, Koos. So Koos was like a really interesting card. Uh, super toxic. I would like to attribute somewhat of my own influence as to this card's upbringing back during caster society's tournaments they were hosting these fourth wall tournaments and to make it thematic i was like oh well i was talking to bats who was the organizer and i was telling them hey listen wouldn't it be funny or cool if we just made coos uh able to proc off of a real tree within eyesight right this is a fourth wall like hypothetical event you're at the new england lakeside so let's make real trees within eyesight so needless to say that this card was a two you know you could cast it for two neutral it had splash damage you may distribute this attack damage to any number of beasties artifacts or casters minimum of five damage per target this thing was just a menace um and it had, you know, type advantage if it was hitting into water. If things were asleep, this is really important to keep in mind, too. If you were to sleep a beastie, Koos could attack and wake him up. It could, um, I believe this could have also targeted Burrow as well. So, through and through, this thing was just a pain in the butt. And Convert. So, Convert was really important to me as a serial growth player. Every deck, uh especially from wilderness on i was like you're you gotta play growth this enabled growth you could bring coos in um if it stayed around for one turn you could tap it for one uh four store and if you had a shock aura or a prism aura on board you were golden to just hit your growth go ahead draw five cards that that helped me win 10 grand in uh top cut of day two so always impactful um they and part of the ruling what why they allowed it at caster cup too this is this is funny because they allowed bonsai plants to count as the plant for growth and bonsais are also considered like real trees i guess so this card you through the design aspect it was never built to be a, a two cost neutral drop but sure enough, during one of MetaZoo's largest events in history, cash money or whatever, this was a, this was a two-drop neutral. So, And then I um, got a preface to say that in the Nightfall meta, or not Nightfall, native meta, or where we left off with things, this is no longer the case. You can't run Coos like this, thank God. Uh, a lot of the player base, there are some folks that still liked it, but... You know, I'm going to just go ahead and say it. The people that really liked it weren't really your competitive players. Um, you know, that probably sounds like a rude thing to say or whatever, but I don't care. Um, 
the people that were playing at a higher level realized how much of a problem that ruling was and having walked it back was definitely the right choice first place caster medal um as far as i know up until <laughs> up to caster cup nobody was playing this card this is probably one of the rarest cards in metazoo nobody talks about this card um as like a collection piece or a player piece it was really only available like within the first less than a year of metazoo's existence it was something that i think they had like less than 10 tournaments and then this was the first place prize of them so only so many players had them easton and i both had this card it is a uh, five drop neutral 75 lp artifact from the cryptid nation set that's important to note the symbol in the top left is the cryptid nation symbol there's a reason for why i'm pointing that out that i'll touch on in a bit and you could fatigue this page to grant 50 LP and 50 damage to all beasties that I, you control until the end of your turn. All effects afflicting your beasties are removed. So um, that would remove your status effects. If you got hit by frog, and frog just douses your beasties with the litany of effects, this removes all of those. And then on top of that, you're literally giving a bunch of one-drop hornets 60 attack and 60 to 65 LP. So... A lot of situations that could be game ending. I mean, yeah, sure, you're giving pets 140 to 150 damage as well, but being able to do that to tokens is pretty wild. Cryptonation, okay, here we go. So, Cryptonation's uh, probably like one of the best cards ever printed as well, and you know, big surprise, it was printed in the first set. By and large, some of the best cards ever printed in the game war printed from the first set. That was a uh, Something that R&D always had to sort of battle with, right? Um, when the foundation of your game was built on like this janky, way overpowered and balanced meta, the rest of the time, and rules, the rest of the time is just going to be continuous like patching and things like that. And I don't, and I don't fault R&D for having to deal with that. Every game has these problems. Um, I think it's silly when people were critiquing MetaZoo for being like a jank game or whatever when the reality is like almost every TCG ever is or has had erratas or jank or fixes. And I mean, Yu-Gi-Oh's changed their master rules like in priority like four or five different times. So yeah, all that said, Cryptonation, cast it for two and you can play any card from MetaZoo Cryptonation without paying its aura cost. So for two, two aura, you could drop this five drop artifact um for two aura you could play kets here and you're golden so you know and guess what's another cryptonation card growth so yet another way to get your growth off uh new year's new beginnings let me organize this a bit new year's new beginnings good card destructive um it's like the delinquent duo of metazoo uh i'd always turn one this one i can just to get the most value off it especially going first um for the yeah both casters must place their entire chapters in their cemeteries you and target caster must then bookmark seven new pages kind of self-explanatory never reason not to run that power up red i think that goes without saying too i keep assuming a lot of people that might be watching this already know about metazoo cards but for those that don't power up red uh, the main thing is you get 100 lp and 100 uh 100 attack right so it's the it's the biggest like damage modifier in the game and the lp bonus is substantial as well so good card bookmark pot of greed uh bookmark two pages from the top of your spell book Super self-explanatory. We run two of those, yeah. Growth. I've talked enough about this. Growth, you know, some some people might have said it was cute, but this thing was always getting resolved. Uh, I was never not playing growth in this deck. Like, it's never like... A, it was never really a brick. Between the Shock Auras and the Prism Auras and the Cryptid Nations and the Coos, it was happening. Which is Lightning. This card came in really... I mean... This one was Easton's doing. Uh, he, well, I, I, I'd say it was a bit half and half. My idea was like, okay, Witch's Lightning is going to be really great 
in the mirror. I already know that I'm going to be playing Lightning Dex uh, Caster Cup. Sure, it's going to be good against, um, you know, water. You get the type advantage. It's hitting for, I think, 40 or whatever. But um, in particular, the the Hornet matchup, if they open Hornets and you're going second, you don't want to play Hornets into that, right? You're going to play your Hornets, and all of them are just going to get popped by theirs. So you kind of had to stall out for at least one more turn to when you can get Aura on board, but this was really important to essentially pop three of their Hornets, right? That It's a one-for-one. One. Uh, you play this, and you get to remove all their Hornets. It was good. So, And those were run at two. And I'm going to touch on this in a second. All right, Hateful Demise. Cool, cool, cool. So this was a really great observation on Easton's part. It just shows like how good of a card player he is as well. But um, Witch's Lightning also had this other effect that really was a bit negligible but until the end of this turn each beast is also considered lightning and gains for strike so uh yeah the first strike part was really critical because you wanted to be able to hateful demise beasties um and some beasties only had one trait this was given this was the opportunity to give a beastie a trait and do damage to them and at this point the damage wasn't too uh important but hateful demise for those that don't know, is you cannot put a page into a spellbook that contains dark spells of three or higher aura costs. This page cannot be prevented. It cannot be prevented is really important. It couldn't be dampened. That's something that the water decks always seem to have when <laughs> you were trying to interact. That and smoky spirits and just the general control cards. Destroy this beastie with at least two traits. That's the part I'm referring to that has, or that has magic proof. This spell ignores magic proof. So being able to delete frog if they um, just open with frog, you're kind of, uh, maybe, you know, on the back, back foot a bit. So this was a really important card. Um, it, it killed cats in the mirror. It killed the crabs that stalled out the game. Um, really all your problem cards, frog in, in particular. So, and it was really important that you would be able to resolve that. So between like, I think there's two in this deck. Between the Dark Aura and the Prisms and the Shock Aura, you had to get it off, right? Um, it, it was possible. It was never felt like a brick. So, Hateful Demise. And that would kind of always stay as a almost a staple. And we ran two of those. And then to really tie it all together was one Necromancy. And again, a Cryptid Nation card kind of slept on. Easton had always been keen on this card. And, you know, to his credit, again, it was just a obviously good card. But I think that my, my case for it was that in a game of resources, you're capped at every lightning deck was capped at four Kets, right? If you, if you beat four of their Kets, you you win um and vice versa this necromancy was your fifth quets and sometimes that was enough to turn the game if they exhausted all their outs all their options to get that fifth quets out the or the fourth quets out you always had one more so and then uh two lightning storms some people did one i always would play two i want to see this card um I want the Kets to be impactful. It's something you would side out, maybe side to one in the mirror, just in case if your opponent does the same thing. You, you, you both could side them out, I guess, and that would be kind of funny, but I would always have one. Um, and then or I'd open, main deck would have two, and then side to one. So, Anyways, that's the, the main deck. Um, and then the side, I think the side... The side definitely changed, I think, the day of, which is kind of natural, where you have like all the jitters and you're just making last-minute decisions, but we'll go through that. Another Shock Aura, maybe, I think, at least in this iteration, was just to make sure that we could get the gross and the dark cards online. Uh, dampen, maybe we'd side in, maybe we'd bring in the Shock Aura and then the Dampens for more of the spell matchup. Uh, there was this Torrential River deck that I was playing against um, 
that my buddy Shillis from Australia came in and he brought that. I was surprising a lot of people at the event, but I was, was kind of aware of it. Uh, I thought Dampen was a, a reasonable response to it. Uh, lightning in a bottle, three of, yeah, three of, I never want to lose in time. So if we're going to the clock and I'm going first or whatever, we're sighting in three lightning in a bottle and we're just going to town. Uh, Sand Squink, this thing is actually was really impactful as well for dealing with fearsome critters. Uh, the fact that it came in with fleet, destroyed a fearsome critter with a less aura cost than this page, which was basically all of the fearsome critters. Uh, the charge counter was nice or whatever, and then its attack is cool, but the really that power just being able to delete fearsome critters was huge. Critters has and always will be a problem in what was left of MetaZoo, and I wanted to make sure that I could win that matchup. So yeah, I think it was just two I ran. No, three. Okay, yeah. I really did not want to lose to Critters. This deck's main strength was playing against water. And then it also had a good matchup against Cosmic. So the meta for Caster Cup was very much Cosmic, Lightning, and Water, and then Critters. My experience most of the day, believe it or not, was Cosmic. Um... I won all my matches with that. I played some lightning. I don't think I played any water. So that was my strongest matchup, and I just did not get to play water, which is fine. And then I played critters, and those critters games just get so scary close, but was able to turn around with these guys. More witches lightnings. Paralyze, which is just like a crazy hand trap. Um, you just automatically get to paralyze a beastie. You can contract at any time. And this again kind of just a generic good lightning card a lot of lightning players would play this in their mono lightning builds at caster cup anyways thanks for watching and uh see you next time